Welcome to Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is John Dolan. John is a tenured CMU professor, retired U.S. Army colonel, and the director of the CMU Masters in Robotic Systems Development Program, which I myself attended. John, welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much, Spencer. It's my pleasure. Thanks for coming on. It's uh, been a long time coming. You're a busy guy, and uh, I appreciate you making the time. Well, thank you. So um, I guess maybe a good place to start for people that aren't familiar with the MRSD program is uh, what does that do that like a normal master's in robotics doesn't do? And uh, how'd you find yourself being the director? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, a friend of mine, a colleague, Hagen Schemp, started the program back in 2011. And he had done well with his own startup company, but he found that one thing that the, the graduates or the engineers that he was hiring seemed to be missing was a knowledge of systems engineering and then also the business aspects of making robotics or making robotic systems. So he wanted to start a program that addressed that and he enlisted the help of a number of colleagues. He asked me if I would teach the project course, which you went through, Thank you. two semester sequence. Uh, another colleague taught the systems engineering and, and Hagen himself taught the business course within robotics. And then we also collaborated with the business school Tepper at CMU to give students some exposure there. And I guess the other thing I would say is that at, at CMU we've now got four graduate programs. One of them is the PhD program, then there's a master's program which is research oriented, but then we have these two professional master's programs. One of them is MRSD, the Master of Robotic Science or Robotics and Systems Development development. And then the other one is for computer vision, and that one's been around a few years. Uh, That's the MSCV. Fewer, the MSCV, right. Yeah. And they're both doing well because there are a lot of robotics companies that want to have uh, people working on systems. Robotics is becoming increasingly popular, increasingly popular, and uh, so they've been able to place uh, people in a lot of great companies. Yeah, I, I'm really grateful for having come through the program, and I... Uh, I want to say even as an undergrad, your mechatronic systems development course really kind of influenced me in a positive way. I don't know if you remember Anton Galkin, but yes, he, yeah, I told him you would. He's like, he's never going to remember me. I'm like, that guy has got a great memory for people. Yeah, you know, John's probably going to remember you. And he said, you know, tell him I said hi. I, I really appreciate the course. And well, I, I guess he built a Connect Four robot. So yeah, yeah, it was good having you in that course. Thank you. I appreciate that. Surprised. I'm, I'm impressed you remember my contributions. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the, the mechatronic design course that you initially took uh, before you entered the MRC program was really the blueprint or the basis for the project course. I expanded it in some ways so that it would stretch over the two semesters. But I got a nice opportunity to be involved with that back around 2000, co-teaching it with Gary Fetter. And uh, yeah, it was a great course in part because it gave well, it gave ECE students, electrical engineering students, an opportunity to build some stuff, which they didn't get too much of an opportunity to do in their CMU curriculum. And then, of course, it pulled in mechanical engineering and, and computer science students as well to form these teams that, in the aggregate, had the expertise to build robots. Yeah. And I will say that's, in some ways, become the blueprint for what I do now for a living. I mean, SKA builds teams that build robots. And yep. A lot of that I learned from you. So. Yeah, well, it's great. I mean, it's great to hear, and, and I think it does contribute to... The, uh, the P Pittsburgh Robotics ecosystem, like I just went over to Gecko Robotics about oh. two weeks ago, having been invited uh, by the, the CEO, Jake Losararian, and he, uh, or I, I met a number of mechatronic design graduates there who were working on robots that in some ways had capabilities similar to the window washing robot they had happened to work on in the course. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome. And I mean, the lectures were fun. Having an opportunity to practice the stuff was fun. At the time, as an undergrad, I was a University of Pittsburgh student, and I didn't really have a whole lot of applied coursework. So, I mean, I took Howie Chosett's course. When I found out I could cross-register at Carnegie Mellon, I just did it as much as I was allowed right, to. Right, I'd forgotten that, but now I remember yeah. now that you say it. That's great. Yeah, and I mean, it was it was huge for me. I, I feel like I, I got connected with, I mean, I met Hagen through cross-registering courses. That's how I found out about MRSD and ended right. up going through there. And I mean, just from what I learned from you in the course and some of the fun lectures where you described, you know, the differences in different types of sensors and motors and all that stuff at a high level. I mean, I've used that as the basis as teaching other people Excellent. at this point, too. Yeah, yeah so. that's great to hear. Yeah. And then I've got a PID lecture I've cribbed from uh, my dad's cousin, Lee Weiss, uh, since passed on, but good, good guy as well. So Lee was a good friend, a good man. Yeah, yeah I agree. Thanks. 
Yeah, I miss him. But uh, he's the one that originally made me want to go into robotics. So That's great. Yeah, he left a positive influence. Uh, he took me into NREC when I was uh, like single-digit age. How about that? And so that's when I was like, oh, I want to build those. <laughs> yeah. Well, Lee was a great guy. He was always... His, his office was right down the hall from me, and he would always drop by with a good word before he was leaving, sometimes give me a ride to my car. Nice. We had lots of good times. I probably gave you uh, more office uh, heckling than I otherwise would have as a result of being on the way to his office. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Apologize for all the times I derailed your thought and you know asked uh, dumb questions when I was learning stuff. Not at all. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate the knowledge you've imparted. So, um, do you find your time in the Army at all has like influenced your time at CMU, or there's any kind of, I mean, obviously it has, but I guess I'm curious as to yeah. how. And well, I think one thing that uh, definitely was helpful was use of time. I mean, you have to get things done quickly. I remember when I was in basic training, we had about 15 minutes to eat, and then they'd bring in the next <laughs> group of people. Wow. Um, and because we had to do so-called physical training and get ready for the Army physical fitness test, I was up five o'clock most mornings, and I've carried that over. Uh, I get up pretty early, uh, go to bed somewhat correspondingly early, I guess. But uh, yeah, and just managing time. I mean, I, I actually didn't do this in the Army. I started doing it more recently, but just trying to schedule each day as it comes, usually the evening before. I do that too. Yeah, because there's so many things to do. It's really hard to to uh, track them all down or to make sure that you get them all done if you don't prioritize and, and set aside the time. And that's something that I sort of informally did in the Army, but then have done more rigorously recently. Upsets my wife sometimes. She feels like I'm too scheduled, and that could be true. But it still helps to get things done. That's awesome. Yeah, I'll usually, it's this is probably a horrible habit, but I'll do mine a lot of times in bed as I'm, trying to shut my brain off, which of course then gets it running faster. I'll, I'll be setting the alarms on my phone and That's right. going through Google Calendar and refreshing my memory as to what I need to do and then making a task list for non-time specific items. Right, right. But I, I think another thing though in the Army that you definitely have to learn is uh, working with managing people, leading people, of course, is what it's called in the military, uh, but you have to do the same thing as a professor you have a team in your lab, you have students sometimes doing projects as they did in the courses that we were talking about. So I think, um, you know, there are leadership principles that you use and just the ability to get along with people, I think. That's awesome. Do you remember, like, any particularly challenging cases that sort of taught you something as a leader that you've then brought forward? Um, well, there was one that I had when I was in reserves where I had a battalion command and I had a, a soldier who was not quite living up to standards, and I had to uh, take action. So I guess it's easy to let those things go, I guess is what I was saying. That's often what happens in our organizations, that people don't um, take action necessary in order to make sure that the best leaders are in place. Uh, and I'm not saying I always did it as well as I could have, but in this particular case, I. I think I handled it reasonably well, though it was not a comfortable situation to be in. And sometimes you have to deal with things like that in the academic environment. We have some, some instances of cheating and other things that need to be corrected and ju not just uh, swept under the rug. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So did you remove this guy from command in that particular case, or did uh, you have to No, just... I didn't go that far, but I had to, I had to do some counseling and, and some uh, uh, writing of uh, evaluations that were not as good as they would otherwise have been. I mean, that's awesome, though. Like, it's it's good that you were able to kind of get ahead of it before it became, you know, the extreme case, you know. That was the hope, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I've, not as much as you, obviously, but I feel like I've been tested a few times, and every time it happens, I mean, it's never going to stop happening. It always teaches you something new. Um, and I, I try to always have that mentality of, like, how do I use this down the line? Yep. So it's good to know it's not just me. <laughs> cool. Yeah. No, I, I just thinking back to MRSD. I remember there was uh, there was another student in particular where we butted heads very hard, and I think you know what I'm talking about. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to name any names, but um, I feel like I learned a lot from that. Um, like I, one thing I learned is that our first impressions of each other were we that were that we were going to get along great, and that we were never going to have an issue, and. I think as a result, we might have opened up and gotten to like a weird dynamic early on. So I've become slower to open up as a result. And then another thing is I never take a relationship for granted. And then another thing is 
just figuring out what level I want to dig my heels on on what things because there's so many things you just need to let go and, and certainly I was guilty of that in those days of digging in on stuff that didn't really matter. <laughs> right. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that because that, that is related to what I was saying before too. We've had uh, you know, your case that you mentioned and, and several other cases uh, where student teams have had some difficulties, whether it's people thinking that other team members are not pulling their weight or um, well, that, that's often one of the problems, or just team dynamics issues, not getting along, personalities clashing. I want, I'd like to see the teams work it out themselves to the extent possible, but sometimes Dimi and I have had to, my colleague Dimi Apostolopoulos, who teaches the system engineering course, uh, have had to get involved and have discussions. And I think, yeah, probably Army experience has been helpful there in terms of just trying to keep calm oneself and keeping the situation calm enough that people can communicate as well as possible, even though they may be uh, somewhat seething underneath. <laughs> yeah, one of my mentors always says, take your emotion out of it, and he was a Navy guy. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. That's helpful. Dimmy, by the way, uh, great dude. I've been trying to get him to come on here. If you can ever nudge him in that direction. Yeah, that'd be great. Super appreciate. I, I really have a lot of respect for that guy, and me too. Um, he's, he's taught me so much. I mean, I... You know, I could probably thank him for a lot of the living I'm earning right now, just from the skills being employed in my day-to-day -day work from his systems engineering class. That's great to hear. I'll I'll uh, let him know if you haven't already. Oh, please, yeah. I I think I might have said something, but I'm sure hearing it from more places would it can't hurt to <laughs> make him you know, realize the positive impact he's had on my life. That's great. So, yeah. Thank thank you. Um, so, what are some of the things that you've learned over the years of um, administrating the MRSD program? It seems like the program's constantly evolving and. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of that's based on just, you know, kind of, you know, try it, see what happens, refine and iterate. Right. Well, I think one one thing that we definitely adjusted on that I think has been helpful was, I believe you experienced this firsthand. When you took the course, it was only three semesters, I think, right? That's correct. So you were, you're part of the old guard and you... Uh, I've been two. No, no. Okay. Uh, that's right. At the very beginning, it was two followed by a seven month internship. That's correct. Okay. So then after that, it went to three semesters and finally we're at four semesters. And we found that with the two and three semesters version versions, it was just, uh, it wasn't too, too, too difficult to be done. Obviously you got through it and, and I think students benefited Barely. from it, but you really had to eat, breathe and sleep, uh, not too much sleep, uh, MRSD. <laughs> And you didn't have as much of an opportunity to do other things. And, you know, some students, you know, they come in with hobbies. Everybody has other interests outside just the technical stuff that they're doing in the program. And it's just kind of, we felt like it was getting too wearing for students and too exclusive. We wanted to give them at least a little bit of free time to be able to pursue other things. Sometimes they use that to be involved with the entrepreneurial aspects of what's available at CMU. But in recent years, students have taken dance class, they've awesome. done rock climbing. Cool. Uh, so when we went from the, the smaller amount of time, the fewer number of semesters to the four semesters, the, num the average number of classes now is still high for a, a college level curriculum. It's four courses a semester, but when you took it, it was five courses per semester. That's right. And that's, that's tough, right? Yeah, and I think I, I mean, I'll, I'll cop to this, you know, with everyone listening. I think I added another semester and dropped it. I was, no, no. Right, right, right. And so as a result, I ended up spending a little more money, but I'm glad that that ended up making its way. Right, the, and we've had a few students do that uh, for various reasons. One thing a lot of students say is they just feel like they didn't get enough time to take all the courses that they were interested in. And, and another reason is to try to spread it out a little bit and dig in and learn uh, more fully some of the things they're studying. Yeah, no, it's an interesting way to put it because I feel like when you're, treading water as it were you know you're sort of just trying to pass the courses but then if you've got a little bit of room to breathe you know maybe you can you know you can use that to rock climb or i mean and or you can use it to you know study the textbook or right. watch a different perspective on you know maybe you check out like you know gilbert strings youtube or whatever right right you know just kind of you can do enrichment and reinforce the lessons in different ways so I mean, it's all good stuff. I, I'm grateful for having done it the way I did it, but I'm also kind of glad that it's evolving and students are getting a way to slow down. And, and now there's even a fourth semester to my third that I added. Right. Yeah, I think it's better for them overall. Um, 
trying to think what other big lessons. I mean, we've definitely made adjustments all along in various ways, and we take feedback from the students and value that. I usually try to prioritize it into things that are kind of low-hanging fruit, can be easily done, make sense, and then other things that are less um, easy to do for whatever reason. One big thing that we haven't done yet that we're, that we're in the midst of trying to do is we've realized that, well, this is fairly obvious, I guess, but uh, software is obviously a, a huge component of robotics. And it's not that students haven't gotten exposed to software. They get a good exposure in the project course and in various other contexts. But we don't have anything teaching software in the Robotics Institute, which I think is actually... Well, that's interesting. It's a gap, I think, right? And I've brought it to the directors before, and they agree with me, but it's not been clear what the best way to address it is. So I've been, I've been talking with a colleague, Oliver Cromer, and with some other folks, including some uh, MRSD graduates, and we're trying to start with at least some kind of sort of software boot camp that maybe you would take in the summer, and we could possibly expand from there. And this wouldn't necessarily be just for MRSD students, because I think it could be helpful for all of the grad students at MRSD. Probably the undergrads, too, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like a lot of times with my CMU coursework, you just kind of get thrown in the deep end, and you're expected to know a branch of mathematics, or like I never got linear algebra as an undergrad, so that right. was tricky to figure out on the fly, right. or you know, like a programming language, and I was a little better equipped there because I had a computer science undergrad, so I was able to quickly pick up new languages, Right. but um, you know, like you said, I mean, there, there definitely wasn't an infrastructure for it, so I feel like that's a, that's a great contribution, and yeah. I'll be interested to see how that pans out. Yeah, I, we've been sort of feebly trying to do it for a couple of years here and haven't really been able to find the time. But I think there's a lot of, in one way, a good way to start it would just be to intelligently assemble material that would be helpful, like go through stuff that's already available on the web uh, and at least make that available in one place for everybody with its focus being the stuff that we think they need to know to be successful in the program. Nice. Yeah, that's, that's a really good first step and like kind of a stopgap. I feel like when I was going through MRSD, we, we sort of did that a little bit for each other. So there was like, I mean, there's definitely a camaraderie with the other students that are in that, uh, forgive my language, but, you know, challenging situation. Right. And I mean, when you're trying to cram all that into two semesters, especially, you know, I mean, there was, you know, there was contention, like I mentioned, but there was also support. And you get really close to your, your classmates and you rely on them heavily and they rely on you. And it was really nice because um, there were definitely some lists like that, like unofficially that floated around or, you know, people would share their notes or like you'd get just, you know, different documents or secondary resources. And that yeah. was all that was all pretty awesome. So to codify that and you might even consider and you probably already thought about this, but just drawing from those unofficial resources and creating the official ones, I'm sure students would be willing to contribute. Yeah. No, that's a great point. We have done a little bit of it. We haven't been as rigorous about it or as thorough as we could be, but we did create, um, well, I think students created a spreadsheet nice. that the program manager, Sarah Conti, has made available. Oh, she's great. Where they talk about, yeah, she is great. Uh, they talk about courses uh, that they enjoyed and, you know, giving information or advice on choosing between different courses when you're trying to pick electives. And so on. Another thing, actually, that I think has been helpful, uh, and this was, I'm trying to think now. Uh, yeah, I guess this was the initiative of Sean Bryan, uh, who had gone through the program somewhat after you. Yeah, I know the guy. He's good. Right. Uh, so there's a, a wiki, which is spo- which, which is meant to capture um, lessons that you won't find in, in textbooks. So things that you learn from building robots that you can't just open a textbook and find. That's, that's interesting, but that's really it, because I feel like if when he's doing that, he's essentially creating a textbook. So right, I mean, it could be like a practical textbook, and there are some, like there's the, I think the editor house, uh, DAK, which does things like that. Uh, so I'm not saying none of this is to be found anywhere, but the typical textbook at a college level is going to be more theoretically oriented, Correct. probably. So we're trying to capture this on a wiki. So that was started a number of years ago. And for a while, I just I gave the students extra credit if they added to it. Nice. Uh, but that's if students are busy and doing well anyway, that's not enough of an inducement, perhaps, to get uh, a critical mass of good material on there. 
So then one of my TAs suggested about three years ago that we actually make each team, each semester, provide one wiki entry. So we've been doing that now for several years, and I think it's, uh, you know, it's a pretty good resource. It's, That's uh, awesome. Maybe not Thank you, Sean. <laughs> fully even uh, in terms of the quality of the material, but it, it's quite good and has a lot of interesting things in it. That's that's really cool. I feel like that's. Uh, I was just thinking like a notion or something would make a lot of sense. So it sounds like that's already there. Yeah, uh, right. It is a good thing, and uh, you know we're we're hoping. Well, I guess we should advertise it a little bit more to the whole community. Right now, it's kind of MRSD specific in that they add to it and and they uh, they make use of it. Some of the teams benefit from it. We we haven't really advertised it within RI, but I think uh, that's something worth thinking about. Kind of want to copy now, <laughs> being an alumnus. Yeah, you could just look it up uh, and oh, use cool. it. It's public. I didn't realize that. That's awesome. Yeah, it's. Um, I mean, I think you might even be able to find it if you post it in the episode description. Yeah, I should I should send you a link. And then, yeah. Uh, yeah, if people are interested who are uh, listening to the program, then they could use it as well. I try to target this at, like, technical people and, and just nerds, to be honest. Like, I, I feel like the level of detail that we get into in these discussions attracts a certain type of person. And right. Anybody that's made it this far probably wants to read that wiki. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think now it just occurred to me. I think if you Google on MRSD wiki knowledge base... I think that'll give it to you. Nice. I'll, I'll check that out. Appreciate it. Sounds good. Cool. So uh, I guess I noticed when I was in MRSD that it was almost uncanny how it created, you know, or it, I mean, not created, it attracted a certain type of personality. So I guess I'll try to explain it. I'm thinking of like sort of type A um, technical, but also business. Pe I've never met a more concentrated group of people like me than I had when I was in MRSD, like surrounding me. And so it, it was interesting to see like, you know, just a filtration and sorting mechanism for, I guess, finding and qualifying people like that. Do you find the other programs you're involved in, like MSCV, have their own personality types that they attract as well? Or is it is it all kind of like a similar archetype to MRSD across the board? I wouldn't say it's similar to MRSD. Now, I, I'm not speaking from extremely detailed inside experience with MSCV, but I do know that they have very high requirements for mathematical knowledge, and they actually, even though it's not a research-based program, I think they're happy if uh, students have some publication record. Uh, so they're really, they're really focused on computer vision and theoretical computer vision and, and understanding, having an understanding of theoretical confusion, uh, computer vision so that you're able to apply it to create real systems. So it's, it's a more narrow and a somewhat more technical focus, I would say, uh, than what we have in MRSD. We certainly are interested in the technical aspects of it, but it's, it's broader based. Um, MSR, I don't know that you can really, and the PhD program, they're more diverse, right? I mean, you can come from a variety of different research backgrounds probably you're not going to have, it's going to be the minority that have the practical robot building experience in those programs. They're more oriented towards algorithms and, uh, and software, probably. Cool. Uh, that's, that's really interesting to hear you explain it that way. And when you said the last bit, I'm just thinking of some of the um, mechatronics and MRSD projects you see where you get all software engineers on the team. And, and just the difference in what it looks like is, is amazing. But then you'll also see teams um, and... <laughs> I won't say my own involvement in some of those, but where there's like an awesome electromechanical thing, but where the software pales. Right. Actually, I used to be really dismissive of software, and I think part of this was just from kind of being maybe a little burned out from getting my computer science degree at the time. But I, I used to, I came to your office one time, I was like, what's the point of all this software stuff? The electromechanical is really the cool part. You're really expensive. Without software, it doesn't do anything. It's just a paperweight. I'm paraphrasing here, I think. Right, but right. You said something along those lines to me, and that really hit. And so... I mean, now whenever, you know, my company SKA is working on a software project, I'll sort of paraphrase what you said to me and say, you know, we're working on all these mechatronics projects, but we found that, you know, it's kind of like the tip of the iceberg protruding and really 70% of the project is software, like in every single one of them, at least. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, that's been interesting to kind of come around to. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons that I do feel like our having at the Robotics Inst Institute something, something more... Um, codified in terms of software is important. It's not that I 
would deny the extreme importance of on-the-job training with software. You have to get your hands dirty and get experience with it. That's really the only way to learn it intimately. But giving some kind of framework to help funnel people into that, I think, would be helpful. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, the idea of putting it during the summer is interesting, too, because I feel like that's that's your opportunity. It would be the summer before people start, I'm thinking, is what you've you're right. targeting. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, and we could initially make it optional. I mean, there may be some software jockeys who don't feel like they need it, uh, but we want to give people an opportunity to spin up. Because I've often had MRSD students in my office who say, I don't have a strong software background. How can I get it? And then I give them advice in terms of coursework, um, experiences they can go after. But it would be nice to have something like what we talked about, what we were calling a software boot camp that would be that place to go. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. So this might even become like a component that everybody goes through when they come That's to what we're state. hoping, yeah, we have to see. I, I really hope, you know, it's so busy. Uh, right now it's the end of the semester, and I mentioned to you before we came on that I'm doing a lot of grading. So it's very hard to yeah. find time, but we, uh, we were very fortunate to get some money from Google that we're going to be cool. able to use. We may be able to pay some of the grad students to help us put this together. So I talked about that with Oliver recently, Oliver Cromer. That's awesome. And uh, if we can get in gear, we'll try to make that happen in the, early in the new year so that we would be ready for the summer. That's, that's great. How did, can I ask how the Google deal came to fruition? I mean, if you're bringing it up, I'm assuming. Well, I mean, I don't know all the details, but basically it was a large grant that the School of Computer Science from the Dean's office was going after, and they were, um, among other things, trying to help underserved students um, get more exposure to robotics. So that's cool. some aspect of what other aspects of the money are, are using, or are being used for rather within the, uh, the university as a whole. Yeah, I mean, I could see that, you know, giving everybody access to a firm software background is kind of thematic in the right, right way. So right, right. That's excellent. Yep. And I mean, what's to say that doesn't get published in other places besides MRSD? Well, we'll see, yeah. I'm sure other Probably people have, uh, they've created their own uh, versions of it. But for example, well, the Air Lab, which uh, Sebastian Scherer runs, has done a really nice job with a similar kind of um, spin-up that they have for their lab, where they're giving exposure to software and to a variety of other aspects. But it's, I think we can borrow some things from that, but it's, it, it still needs to be tailored a little bit more, I think, for what we think the uh, MRSD students need. That makes a lot of sense, and it's great that you've already identified a template for it. So yeah. talking about saving time, I mean, that's a great way to do it. Yeah. So... I guess um, I'm trying to think where to go from here, and um, I guess what keeps you doing this? Like, what, what causes you to show up to work every day, and, and what makes you want to stay this course? What, you know, sort of brought you here in your career, I guess, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I really find it fulfilling to see students do well, uh, to, once they leave the university, feel like they got something worthwhile. Uh, I, I actually enjoy making connections with companies, and I have a lot of them now through my directorship of the MRSD program, and to be able to facilitate uh, connecting students with those companies, getting their resumes in front of them, uh, is, it's very fulfilling, I'd say, because I feel like I'm really helping people find out about opportunities that might otherwise have been denied to them or just unknown to them. And of course, uh, it's great to see students uh, build exciting and cool robots and to do things that haven't been done before, which happens quite often in MRSD. Uh, one example is an early on in the first year, we had a, a team build a, a robot that was actually able to dig using a screw type device. And then they, they wrote a, a, I think it was an ICRA paper for that, one of the big robotics conferences. That's really cool. Yeah. How did that, I guess, and this, this is kind of me being a nerd coming out, but how did that anchor to the ground and how did yeah, that actually it manifest? So it? it had enough, uh, it didn't really have to grab the ground. It had enough weight so that with a, an Archimedean screw, it was able to go into at least a sandy um, surface, right? So it wouldn't have been able to do the same thing with uh, hard ground or clay types of surfaces. But if, there, if it was more like sand, it was able to dig into it. That makes sense. How did you steer? How did they steer, I should say? Yeah, I'm trying to think. It's been 10 years now, so I don't know if no they worries. had a steering uh, capability or not, but I think they did do a little bit in that direction. 
The nice thing about it, and here's an advertisement for what's available, is just like for your project, if you go to the MRSD website, you can find their final report and get details on nice. it. Nice! So, that's not, so all, my, all my work I did at MRSD is published there too? That's right, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Well, uh, I'm a little bit ashamed of where I was at that point in my career because I've come quite a ways since then, but I guess that's what got me here. So yeah, check it out if you, uh, <laughs> if you like. <laughs> that's really cool. Did not realize that lived forever. Yep. Yeah, that's one of the things we want to have a, a persistent presence on the web. I mean, for a variety of reasons. One of them is that it's a good advertisement for the program. Uh, it's a good advertisement for the students. I've had a number of students tell me that when they go to interview for companies, and uh, they say, hey, you can look at my project on the website. That's been uh, helpful in giving them a leg up and getting hired. Nice. And um, it also gives opportunity for incoming students who might, be want, who might want to work on uh, a similar kind of project to find out what's been done by earlier teams and learn from them. That's really good that you're filling that knowledge transfer gap because I, I see that in my professional life a decent amount, which is, you know, a team coming in and reinventing the wheel from what the team before them did. And yeah, it's tough specific. to avoid entirely, but yeah, with the wiki and with this, we do try to do it to some extent. And one, one thing I've been trying to do in recent years more is to press sponsors to continue their project for multiple years so that it can be matured and teams have links across the uh, generations of, oh, cool. of the program. Yeah, when I, I feel like even in my day when I was involved, um, there were some projects like that that I saw as persisting themes, you know, through the Mechatronics course and the MRSD course. So right. it's good to know that's still continuing. And right. Yeah, Search and Rescue is one that comes up over and over again, and there's another Search and Rescue team this year. Nice. That's awesome. What are some of the projects you're, you're like, really, ex I mean, I, you probably can't say because they're all awesome, but... Well, I mean, just the ones that are in recent memory are, are the ones that are easiest to, to think about the details on. Um, one thing that is ongoing is some lunar rover related oh, cool. stuff. So we had, we've actually is had- Is that Chris? Which? Uh, there was a guy named Chris. I think that's one of the current students from uh, the climate gym. It could be, but uh, I don't know which one, which Chris you're thinking of. Oh, uh, the team, so we've got, I think we actually had three years in a row students working on this. One of them was doing uh, navigation up to the edges of lunar pits and then imaging those pits. Oh, cool. Then the second one was smoothing the lunar surface, the so-called lunar regolith, in order to create a uh, suitable substrate for building other structures on the moon. Yeah. And then the one from this year, they're just getting started, is uh, starting to build on that regolith. So creating berm-like structures, uh, not to go skiing, but you know, to build up <laughs> something, you know, whatever, human habitat, or I guess an example of what they use berms for, which I did not know until I read their conceptual design review, is as a way to uh, cushion or um, bear the brunt of some of the uh, blast that comes from launching uh, oh, that's ves vessels on the surface of the moon. So I'll be honest, I, I, the word berm isn't in my vocabulary, but I think you're referring to like the thing that happens when you compact dirt against, you know, like the edge of like running a snowplow or something. Yeah, right. So, I mean, okay. a berm, context. I, I, the reason I was joking about skiing is because uh, the trick skiers will go over a berm and that causes them to fly into the air and then they go back down. On oh, the ground. neat. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, got it. That's really cool. I think, yeah, I think the guy I was talking to, he'd worked at Honeybee Robotics. It's, he mentioned a, a moon bulldozer, so it sounds like it's probably one of those. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, so that's, that's neat to see some of those unfold. I was really excited when I saw the, the team that was working with Smith & Nephew Robotics when I came back to the reunion, and um, I'm just a big fan of those guys in general. Yep. Um, but just to see the, uh, the hip replacement and, and some of the methods they were using and Yep. I've been honestly just really impressed across the board with the stuff that the current students have been doing. Um, it's come a long way since, I mean, I think the tech has come a long way, but you're also just getting really good caliber students and getting really good work out of them. And it's, it's impressive to see right. and I think, in. And this is related to what you were saying before, but I think, you know, all this building up of knowledge, students being able to see what was done before, the other factors that you mentioned with more and more uh, and, and higher grade sensors and other things being available, but I just think the earlier classes uh, set some great standards and we learn from you guys to incorporate those into the requirements so that their final documents are really high quality uh, pieces of work that they would not 
uh, have to be ashamed to turn in as products as employees at companies. And I often have students tell me that that's uh, their experience. They go and they feel like they're doing pretty much the same thing uh, that they were doing in the program, but they have more time on weekends, right? Badass. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, um, that's awesome. I, I remember when I was an intern at SpaceX, I told my cousin Lee, I'm like, ah, they're working me so hard. I'm pulling these crazy weeks. I did a 19 hour day on a Friday. He goes, great, that'll be good practice for MRSD. <laughs> <laughs> he, yeah, he, he knew what was going on at MRSD. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he wasn't wrong. But um, honestly, it's all been good practice for my career. Like at the time, I think I was a little bit, I lamented it because I felt like, you know, I was, you know, I was maybe near the edge of burnout or, or working just crazy hard on this stuff. But now I'm grateful for it because I feel like it, it you know, like you said, it's it's the same thing, but with a little more time on weekends. I and mean, right. it's, right. it's prepared me to be a more successful professional. Yeah. Yeah, I give a lot of credit, credit to Hagen because he had come from a company. He knew what the key skills were that were needed. We've augmented that over the years and learned lessons, but I think he set a really good direction at the beginning. And like I said, I, I have people coming and saying, hey, uh, we used all the systems engineering and the, the skills that we got in the project course in this project that we're doing at um, you know, Blue River Systems or whatever company it is they're working at. And that's one of the most, that's one of the greatest things you can hear, I think, as a teacher. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll also say that as, you know, like a current, you know, I guess employer, I mean, I'm bringing people in on projects. I mean, I look at the MRSD resume books. When I hear somebody is a student, I'll, I'll be honest, a little bit of the time I'm like, ah, oh, I'm gonna have to train this person. This is gonna take forever. Um, I mean, not to sound pessimistic, but there is a huge training overhead and, and, you know, more junior engineers because, you know, they're coming online oftentimes for the first time, you sure. know, on a, on a job job. Right. And I, I was no different myself. Um, and what I will say is when I see somebody that's a student MRSD or the CMU Robox Club, uh, I get a little bit excited and I'm like, I think this is going to be different. You know, like these, these guys are a special breed. So. And? I've had good success. Good. Like I... I there's one guy, he wasn't MRSD, he was in the Masters of ECE program, but he did work while he was getting his Masters for us on a project that um, was, was the biggest we had done at the time. And he was critical of project success, you know, even as a current student. But one of the differentiating factors for him, I think, was that he was in the CMU or Box Club, and I know it's not MRSD, but I think it's a little similar with the project basis. Right, right. And, um, Part of it was I could see what he did before I, I was bringing him into a project, so I had some trust built up. Like, I know how this guy thinks as an engineer. I know how he approaches a problem. Right. And then another part was, you know, I know this guy, you know, gets off on building robots, and it's something he seriously enjoys and yeah. thinks about, you know, probably in his dreams, and so that's the kind of person I want to work with. That's great. I mean, there's no doubt CMU has an unusually strong reputation among companies in Pittsburgh, Silicon Valley, uh, everywhere. Uh, I mean, to some extent, it's almost a mystique, but people just, I think it has to do with work ethic, preparation in terms of the courses and experiences they've gone through and actual uh, experience with building robots. Yeah, that's interesting. Do you ever, when you're, when you're teaching these courses and you're putting people through the ringer in this way, and we sort of talked about this earlier, and you're absolutely right, by the way. I agree with you completely on everything you've said, and I think it's a well-deserved reputation. But do you ever think, like, maybe I'm pushing this person a little too hard, or do you, do you kind of look at, like, the light at the end of the tunnel and say, oh, they'll be grateful because we're giving them a useful endurance? Well, I think we've got things tuned reasonably well now so that we're not pushing people too hard. Too hard. Um, I think earlier when you went through the program, we probably were pushing people too hard in the sense that not, not that we ever, excuse me, uh, had people pushed to the point of despair or, or physical breakdown, but what I said before, that you didn't have time to pursue some other things or to just have a good work-life balance. Um, but now I think we've tuned things pretty well, like the, the period of time that we use for the uh, progress reviews in the uh, project course corresponds roughly to what industry practices like two week sprints nice. if you're using an agile scrum approach yeah. uh, and we interleave that with some team meetings and other things so it seems the rhythm seems pretty good and like I say we've learned over time 
Yeah, and I mean, I will say from interacting with the current crop of MRSD students, I mean, they all seem pretty well adjusted and happy and healthy. So, I mean, it's not that we weren't, but I mean, they, they seem to really be absorbing a lot of knowledge and taking courses they find interesting. And that's one of the things they'll talk about when I was at the reunion and, and meeting a bunch of them. Right, right. And uh, I mean, even the demos I've been I've been trying to attend. I feel like I can't get to as many as I'd like because my work schedule gets in the way. But yep. You know, I'll put MRSD demos in my calendar because I like seeing what they're up to. And, Good. And, well, thanks know, for coming. Thanks yeah. for having me. Cool. So I feel like this is probably a, a good place to wrap up. We're just about at time here. Yep. Is there anything uh, you want to plug or kind of leave with or just sort of put on, on the tail end of the episode just to kind of leave people with? Well, I think, uh, yeah, I don't really have anything definite, uh, I guess. Maybe just uh, express my appreciation for your having me on and an opportunity to talk about something that I do love doing, which is teaching and uh, preparing students for a career in robotics. Um, I do hope that we're uh, doing better in the respects that I mentioned in terms of the balance that we seek to achieve. Uh, I guess maybe one thing that I will throw out there that maybe is, has already been a topic for you and I think we could strengthen in the Robotics Institute in general is um, grappling with the issue of ethics and using robotics and artificial intelligence in an ethical way. It's gained headlines in recent years with some of the things that happened with uh, uh, different AI algorithms, uh, certainly. And we've, like one of my colleagues, Ilan Norbox, has done a nice job of uh, making available to some of us at the Robotics Institute some tools for incorporating that in our courses. But I'd say we, it's not at the top of the list of the things that we concern ourselves with. We tend to get very busy with building robots, heads down, working hard. So I do think that's something that uh, I would like to pay increasing, increasing attention to in the, the next period. That's interesting. I, I thought MRSD did a good job of giving a sort of an objective top level view of an ethical framework okay. by doing things like the trolley problem in the business course. and. By by comparison, I guess uh, an ethics course I took in undergrad was um, it was a lot more subjective. Like you know, it's like these are the professor's objectives in particular, and the one I took at MRSD I thought was more philosophical and objective. But maybe maybe uh, I wouldn't say less actionable, but maybe there's something that could be done with regard to addressing that actionability of like how do I now decide if I should be doing something in addition to how do I accomplish that goal? Right. Well, I'm glad to hear that you guys talked about that because I'm not always familiar with everything that goes on in every class. Um, and I'm not certain that it's going on right now in the version of the business course that, uh, that Parag Batavia is teaching. It may be, but, uh, but yeah, it seems like there could be somewhat more done. But again, I'm glad to hear that you felt like you did get some good exposure. It was, maybe it was only like a day or two, but right. they brought in a bunch of guest lecturers and um, it, was, it was more of a high-level philosophical overview of different ethical frameworks and just understanding, you know, what is ethics and what are some different things that make you think about it in a difficult way. But it wasn't really as much case studies or applied ethics, if that makes sense. Right, right. So. Yeah, we could perhaps have some more of that. Uh, there's always the challenge of uh, trying to figure out how to fit everything you want oh, to sure. into the curriculum. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I told my dad about that course, and he was really dismissive. He's like, ah, we had that crap in med school. Like, ah, well, that's the problem, right? I mean, yeah. there's the fundamental question of how do you best introduce it? And if you make the decision that you're going to just do one course that's kind of separate from everything else, then your dad's uh, reaction is the expected one, right? It's, oh, we had to do it. Just like in the yeah. Army, we have to do certain training once a year, and then we can easily forget about it. So I think it is a challenge to make it the part of the warp and woof of uh, not just the program, but the way that people conduct themselves within yeah. the Robotics Institute. Well, that all rubs off. I mean, I, I, you're definitely shaping you know the, another generation of engineers, and there'd be a small kernel of really, really good engineers that will go on to be managers and directors and you know executives. Right. But right. Um, it's interesting to hear that because I, I feel like there's second and third order effects from the decisions you make there. So it's, it's kind of cool to get a glimpse into how your brain works with regard to planning that stuff. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Um, maybe uh, that's a good place to cut it. Um, but I'll say thanks for coming on. Right. And, uh, thank you, Spencer. Really thank you, John. It. Yeah, I really appreciate your time.
All right. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming up.